Hello, welcome to Data Talks. Today, a quick reminder before we start, we invite you all to visit our project's website, data-talks.uni-münster with ue dot de. And also to hear our other episodes available in our website or in our YouTube channel and also in Spotify in Data Talks www.usp. Data Talks VVU USP. So, uh, without further ado, with the development of the internet and the dissemination of personal computers, many philosophers, sociologists, political scientists, and activists started to think of ways in which technology would promote more democracy. The internet servers became increasingly cheap way to store information, and without the need of intermediaries, citizens could reach governments and finally tell them what they want. Well, almost 30 years after the beginning of this wave, a lot has been made, but on the other hand, there is still a lot to be done. As we talked about in previous episodes, technology is indeed a powerful tool that enables civil society to have access to their rights, as well as to monitor where governments are or are not doing. Besides, technology enables bottom-up initiatives, which might bring change based on collective intelligence. And how can we develop a and how can we develop digital democracy initiatives that use public data and have an actual impact in communities, in people's lives? How can citizens' initiatives create a space where they promote change by confronting or working together with governments? Today, we have two special guests who will bring their experience and examples that we can learn with. From Brazil, we received today Professor Dr. Gisele Craveiro, full professor from the Graduate Program of Social Change and Political Participation of the Escola de Arte, Ciências e Humanidades from the University of São Paulo, and coordinator of the Colaboratório de Desenvolvimento e Participação, CoLab, a research center also based at USP that brings together government and citizens, enabling participation also through technological solutions. She also participates in the Open Data Research Network in the Latin America Open Data Initiative, which investigates emerging impacts of open data. She coordinates solutions for online participation, such as Cuidando do Meu Bairro and Monitorando a Cidade, recognized worldwide and analysis and co-design transparency and open data policies. So Professor Gisele, thank you very much for being with us today. Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and invitation for this amazing event. And thanks for all you here to, to talk about such important issues today. And from Germany, we received today Sonia Fischbauer, who is the community strategist at the Open Knowledge Foundation Germany. She specializes in designing and managing community-driven process and programs in the intersections of technology, politics, and society. She is a full-time point of contact for Code for Germany, a network volunteer civic tech open government and open data experts. The network comprises a community of over 500 volunteers who work on sustainable digital change in politics and administration. They meet online in, and in local groups called OK Labs all over Germany. Sonia previously worked for several other civic initiatives, including Wikimedia Germany and Wikimedia Austria. Other open data projects she led, she is lead, she's led sorry, include visual, visual analytics in data-driven journalism, valid, Guten Tag via Guten Daten, and the open data portal Austria. Sonia, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks very much for the invitation, and uh, I'm glad to be here in such excellent company. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start with uh, Professor Giselle. Uh, 
Uh, you are one, uh, the coordinator of the collab, uh, this uh, lab that I mentioned in the, in the introduction at the University of Sao Paulo, and you develop civic technology solutions among your work. Could you explain to us uh, what civic technology means and tell us more about the projects you developed in collab? Thank you so much for this question. It's important to, to put some base here for our discussion, because sometimes people think that uh, technology is the main point, is the main subject. So maybe we should uh, say a methodology or a process. So in our research center, uh, our research center, in fact, is a multidisciplinary uh, research center that also develops uh, initiative with uh, communities, with governments, in order to understand what fits best for each situation. So we are trying to investigate and apply our knowledge uh, on the ground in order to, to build a kind of virtual cycle. So we develop methodology, we, we test them with people, with institutions, and also we this this learnings, this uh, knowledge, this knowledge, this social knowledge, this common knowledge, we try to refine the methodology, the process uh, in order to iterate. So digital technology is uh, the smallest part. In fact, we are trying to understand which groups, uh, how, um, how can we gather them, how we can uh, build such um, collective uh, intelli intelligence, how we can develop and also put this into action in order to do social transformations. So we, we have many projects, uh, right now, but I'd like to bring to you to, to our discussion. Uh, I think the the most prom prominent that are caring for my neighborhood, cuidando do meu bairro. So it's a tool to grab open data, uh, open budget data. So uh, automatically it collects data from the uh, from the public government in Sao Paulo city and try to put, put this data in a more easy way to comprehend because the budget data is not so easy to, to engage uh, in order to understand. So we try to put all this data on the city map. So it's a tool to monitor in real time the budget execution in the city level, in the local level. And also, it also offers a tool to put questions to the local authorities. So sometimes we don't have, uh, most of times, we don't have perfect data. So budget data is not always directly linked to the to the needs the informa the information needs of the people so when it, it when it doesn't meet the needs people can send questions that are sent uh, via the uh, our tool and both the questions and all the answers are published in the same online space in order to make this more visible, in order to share this knowledge with uh, everybody that's interested. So basically this is uh, caring for my neighborhood uh, next year. Uh, it will, uh, we will have its 10th anniversary. So it's, we have been applying this methodology, this tool and methodology with many different social groups uh, with many capabilities, different capabilities, uh, and also um, ways to apply this knowledge, apply this information in the, in the process, in the participation process. Uh, the second project is calling Monitorando a Cidade, 
Uh, it's originally uh, called Promise Tracker. It, it was uh, made in, in the center of civic media in MIT with our colleagues, uh, Emily Heiser and many others. And it is a, a, also a methodology and a tool in order to have collaborative data collection because we identified that some uh, in many times we don't have good quality data or even public administration, they, they don't have the, the data necessary to monitor the, their public policy the service deliver, delivery to. So we started to develop this methodology in order to have the people in this place to gather the data, now the citizen engagement on, on this process to gather uh, the data on the territory in order to have a uh, better dialogue with local authorities. So it's a tool that's very flexible and it's applied in, in many process regarded, regarding uh, social accountability process. For instance, uh, students in a school monitoring their uh, uh, lunch offer. So, Oh, other example is uh, also students uh, understand some uh, science um, subjects and also monitoring the water quality of the rivers, of the many water fonts, source uh, nearby the schools. And I can also bring other examples regarding the school infra infrastructure also the community school gathering data and making a collective view of, um, of this diagnosis in order to better talk to the, the responsible authorities. It's not always a um, bottom up, a top down process and sometimes we mix bottom up and, and top down approaches. So basically, uh, these are the, the main initiatives that I can bring for our conversation today. Thank you, Professor Gisele. I, I just two small questions to, just to clarify uh, before I go to Sonia, because there is also a lot of initiatives that uh, she works with. And, uh, but I would like to, to know the Promise Tracker, uh, I, I saw the website, it works with more than one city hall, right? It works in more than one municipality. Yeah, that's right. Promise Tracker or Monitorando a Cidade work all over the territory and the, the national territory. And also we have some examples that uh, it was used in, uh, overseas in other countries and in Germany too, and Latin and Central America and, and so on. And, but the, the, the main use of this tool was in Brazil in hundreds of schools and thousands of, by thousands of students. Well, thank you very much. And now I'm going to talk a little bit with uh, Sonia. Uh, Sonia, you work in initiatives that publish and use open data in Austria and also in Germany. Uh, now you're working uh, together with the uh, OK Labs, uh, which I need to tell, I participate in a few of their meetings. Oh, I really? participate, yeah, in OK Lab Bonn, OK Lab uh, Münster, uh, and also Cool. If I'm not wrong, I I, I saw some in NRV. I, I wanted to, and and they are quite self-organized. And I thought this was really interesting to to meet this uh, civic hackers. But anyway, I was now the question. <laughs> uh, can you explain to us uh, about these projects and and share uh, some examples on how civil society initiatives might impact communities? Absolutely. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to just um, follow up on uh, Giseli, the 
listeners in the who will hear about this in the podcast will not have seen me like furiously nodding and agreeing and being impressed by all of those uh, empowering approaches because I do think that that um, that is those are such good examples of how you can um, hold governments accountable and also empower citizens and you combine so many approaches you have the open data thing you have citizen science you have civic tech open government i'm really excited about all of this and i hope that i now will do our um, um wonderful volunteers justice uh, of which you have once been a part of <laughs> jessica um because there's about like depending on who you count as active or not about like a couple of hundred volunteers all over Germany who are, like you said, quite self-organized in local groups. They meet regularly either online or in physical spaces, um, mostly in physical spaces before 2020, but also, um, also now we meet more, we meet more like, like, central online and uh, they come together to discuss um, local local data policies local uh, government um, lo local government and what what local government does in regards to openness accountability and open data and then they often find themselves right in this um, in this connecting middle part uh, and doing what the government sort of like doing this translation, doing this translation thing, like you said, Giselle, where the government releases data and the data isn't sometimes isn't like very easily accessible or it's not it's not clean. It's like um, contained in a PDF and you can't really access it. And then volunteers because they just want to they they enjoy coding or they enjoy this um they enjoy this like a civil hacking in a positive way uh, they will develop like small to medium to big scale solutions of little civic tech projects such as for example a um a little website or a little app that uh, measures the quality of your drinking water in your area that pulls the data released from various various data sources and you can then like sort of type in where you live and see what's your what's your drink water nutrient quality or um, air data and how, how clean is the air around you there is a project called luftdaten.info which is just airdata.info or, or now they are on sensor community and they are now a worldwide project where you can like get yourself, get your hands on a little inexpensive DIY kit with which you can collect air quality data in your hometown and then release that data into this platform so that it can be shared and like worked with all over the world. And those are very hands-on approaches. Those are very hands-on solutions. Um, another example is a, a little app that uh, is called Waldbrand app which is forest fires app that is helping local local firefighters to better deal with forest fires and very often our volunteers also are the experts that are that are needed as somewhat as as policy advisors or because they have been working on this like this whole open data thing for the last 10 years. And I feel like even though the German government in their now, in their new, with the new government, with a new coalition agreement, there are some promising, there are some promising, well, promises. <laughs> we'll see how they will be tracked and whether those will come true. But um, the government is not as far as far ahead as we would like it to in terms of data strategies, in terms of transparency standards. Germany has yet to sign the Tromsø Convention, which is an international standard for transparency. And um, so very often our volunteers are also advocates for better policies and for policies that not only benefit economic interests and businesses, 
but also like are good for the people, are good for citizens. And I feel like that's a very, that's a very vital part of our work. Like for the volunteers and me as a, as a full-time employee at the Open Knowledge Foundation at this NGO, we are sort of like a mouthpiece for, for civic society, for, for the public to have a counterpart to business lobbying. You know? Because the data, like data is often framed as, oh, so valuable for businesses and you can make startups with that and da 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 But it's, it's not just that. And with all of this, with all of us talk about innovation and we must have new things and da, da, da. this is a very this is very business driven and business oriented approach and, and speech and so we're there to do our part and influence policies and send out statements and comment on the coalition agreement and analyze it so to make well to make this um, voice of the public heard so for the common good that's what we work for or try to well, I need to, I need to, and now we are knocking, we're not nodding, nodding with our heads <laughs> all the time. Yes, yes. <laughs> because um, there is a, a thing about the OK Labs that I thought, I thought it was really interesting when I first had the contact with them, that um, the projects were really local and and also uh, you see what, uh, and this was, I was so excited to do this episode because uh, in both of our examples that we bring from, from the CoLab, from the OK Labs, uh, and from other examples that we have contact with uh, direct or indirectly, uh, we see how, how people can develop their own solutions. I mean, uh, the local firefighters was a project that I didn't know, for example, and I thought, and I was thinking right now, wow, yeah, this might be a problem in a region that is uh, that is too dry, where there is a lot of forest, for example. Uh, this might not be a problem everywhere, but it's a problem somewhere. And sometimes uh, we don't even know that. We don't even know that this is a problem. And the in the Oka Labs, my experience in that was uh, there was a lot of uh, focus, problem focus in in the sorry, that there was a lot of solutions that what we're thinking focus in the problems. And there is always a, 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 a thing that I would like to stress. I think this, this is the, like the third or fourth episode that I say the same thing that is uh, the difference of data that we have in Brazil and Germany, right? Because uh, I, I, we, a question that a friend of mine, uh, Alice, uh, also a Humboldtian from the cohort that I came with, uh, she was stressing was, okay, but if you're thinking about cities using uh, sustainable data to, to make more sustainable cities, how, how can we, uh, are, are we using this or not? Because the scientists have that and we, we can do a lot of things, but what we are doing the local level. So this is one of the examples that I think that there is a lot that might come up from that and even things that we are not thinking of. May I add one point too? It's very important to stress uh, something that Sonia said. Uh, we, we all came from the same movement. So we are working for an open world, an open and collaborative world. So, so we are gathering here in order to discuss how can we access data and how and how this can also gather people in order to exchange different ideas different view point of views in order to solve a common problem so we have to to develop uh, such collaborative uh, ways to do so so yes uh, this this startup environment, this way to see technology in order to, to develop individual solutions from an individual perspective, uh, maybe is overvalued in our society today. So it's very good to have such initiatives that uh, bigger or big or small contribution do import, do work. So I think we are 
talking about such environment that can open up to different needs, different views. It's very important to, to stress this point because we are, at least in Brazil, we are living in a such polarized society. So we should also look more for social coalition, social cohesion in order to, to deal with such a complex scenario we are living in. Yeah, thank you for like bringing it back to or like tying a bow to our our shared goal because I think that's something that we need to talk about more often or in every discussion about technology it's very easy to get lost in some buzzwords and with all of the K, uh, like AI money flowing in now and all of the all of the other like buzzword. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say the B word, but, uh, <laughs> you know, all of, all of the um, buzzword technologies. And, but what, what are we doing it for? Yeah, we're doing it for a world where everyone can equally participate and a world that is like where equity or, or um, equality is in place and where people are included in decisions and can participate on on a local level at least with engage with their communities be active and um mundig citizens what's mundig when you can when you are empowered and you can you can you can speak for yourself and you can make informed decisions and that's what we're doing it for we're not doing it for specific technologies and blah blah even though it does matter which technologies you use and it does matter that data for example should be should be linked data so that it can be easily or like easiest accessible and that it can be combined with other data and then you can build upon it more easily in the same way that we want to build upon our shared knowledge that's why we want to share the knowledge so that we can create more together because if you like work in your little chamber and work on your one great startup invention idea then you're going to develop the same things over and over again which is a problem that we're actually seeing when governments do not build or, or yeah, governments, local governments or on a, on a bigger national scale, when they are just always asking for new innovative solutions, but they are not looking at what's already been developed. And this is where we as civic societies can offer a lot because we have this 10 year plus knowledge of our engaged communities. And there is also one thing uh, that not uh, every solution will fit every context. What is need in Bayern might differ, differ from what is need in NRV, what is need in Piauí might differ, but from what is need in Santa Catarina. So we, we might have problems or even similar problems, but the solutions are not going to be the same. So the local, the local participation is also another way to, to make this possible, right? To, to, to bring up, uh, there is a lot of, uh, in political science, we talk a lot about, um, uh, as, uh, not in, sorry, not even political science, more in the public administration theory, we talk a lot about uh, service evaluation. But uh, for more than 10 years, uh, which is the, some, the, the age of some of the projects we mentioned already, uh, we have opportunity to do so much more than service evaluation. Sometimes I'm uh, looking at the theory, sometimes I'm, I'm like uh, scared of how some people are behind that, are not seeing that. I, I, I would like to, to come back uh, if, uh, or actually to go on, but a little bit coming back uh, to the example that Giselle brought from uh, Cuidando do Meu Pai, who uh, I, I also entered and I saw, I was looking for data in my old neighborhood, Santa Cecilia in Sao Paulo, and I saw that the city hall of Sao Paulo was uh, reforming a, a, a square there, a praça, Praça Marechal, uh, Marechal Deodoro, I think, I don't remember the name of the, under the Minhocão, and they were doing one or two other uh, interventions there, and there was the, the, the money, if the money was already uh, approved, 
I don't exactly know the translations from, from Portuguese to English for that. Uh, empenhado, uh, gasto e pago, né? Empenhado. Uh, allocated, uh, yeah, allocated and paid. Allocated and paid. Pla planned, <laughs> alloca planned, allocated and, and, pla and paid. And I like, thank you. <laughs> and I like very much that you, um, uh, that, that the, 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 the project bought the, this moment of the money because uh, when it's just planned, it means that you can still change. And, and I, got, I got curious uh, about it. So, um, so I make two questions in one. Um, if Giselle, if you could explain to us uh, how, how do you know, the, how do you see that the people are using this information about uh, expenditures? This is not an easy information to spread because sometimes we look at it and say, oh, interesting, but okay, what can I do? And if there was already a, this is this come up when we were talking about the, the, the in the beginning of the conversation, uh, if you already, if you know any situation that the, the, the tool made the city hall, a question that was made to city hall, for example, prevent a uh, construction work or an intervention to be done or a change a little bit, it would be interesting to, to know something about that if, if you have an example. Oh, great. Many questions, difficult to answer in short time, but I will try. Uh, I think uh, it's better to it's better begin with the, our notion of openness. So we have two sense in open. So open, you can see it's transparent and open. Please come here, participate with us. So we both use this, this same word, this, this, this same words for two meaning, meanings. It's very important that we are always trying to deal with both transparency, accountability, and participation in all initiatives. We are not, not all, um, we are not only demanding this from the public authorities. We are trying to de develop our projects under this philosophy. So we have um, a design uh, centered in the human, center in the, the user. So the first question, in order to, to invite someone, who, who is this person? Who is this group? Uh, where they come from, what they are their needs for this information that are I'm trying to deal with it. So I have the budget information. And as a computer scientist, I was not able to understand the budget data. So I realized that it was very tough for an ordinary citizen, there is no idea how to grab this data from the portal or even understand what is allocation, what is such a budget concept in order to understand the process, the whole process. So we try to put this in another language, in the, in the map vision, in the map visualization in order to see, in order to test an hypothesis that most people would prefer this kind of data offering instead of a spreadsheet with uh, hundreds or thousands of lines full of numbers and concepts very, very difficult to deal. So this is the, our first uh, part of our project. Uh, most people, uh, I think 10% of people prefer the map visualization. So the map was a strategy in order to engage people. Please come here, look at this. So the map is, very, is a very powerful tool in order to first show the scenario and everybody had the same experience that you have Jessica. Oh, let me see my neighborhood. Let's let me see what's going on my my home, my my street. 
So that's why we, we, we put the name caring for my neighborhood, cuidando, not uh, put or eye or monitor. Huh? So uh, have an emotional link with the budget data in order to uh, develop uh, the interest to, to take care of the public good, the common good. The city is everybody's city. The street is everybody's street. That school, that square is everybody's school and square. So we, we should look to our, to our public goods as something we should care on, 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 on them. So this is, was the, the strategy in order to see if public data would uh, help us in order to develop, de develop this. So the public data was not enough to fit into people's uh, needs, uh, fit into people's expectations. So, oh, I have this square here, but oh, how, how are they are planning to put uh, this kind of equipment or my school aren't going to, to have uh, more rooms or less rooms. So people naturally uh, started asking other oh, very, very good questions. And this is the main part in order to open, come here and, and help us in order to better understand how we are caring for my, uh, our city. How are we are planning to, to better uh, develop public service and public policies? So we are interacting this project with the knowledge, with the learnings people uh, gave to us. That's very, that's very powerful. And I wrote a couple of things down maybe to a later tweet or just to remind myself of and um, have my work influenced by. I find it really great that you gave two definitions for the word open or that it has two facets. One, the like, yeah, that it should be open and transparent and accessible and accountable. And then open as in welcome, come in. We welcome you into our, with open arms. And I do find that very nice. And I think that's something that a lot of projects lack or I think that that can be the missing link for a lot of for a lot of things to create this emotional link between citizens and data and I think that's a great example I'm gonna have a gonna have a good research of that project later yeah because I think that's where a lot of um, that's where some projects especially if they are created by volunteers who are into who are geeky about tech and they they really love their they really love experimenting with data and then I have high data literacy but they want to do something for for everyone for the common good and then to have this in mind that you should create an create an emotional link I think that's also what a lot of open government sort of like open government projects that are not that are trying to engage more citizens and get more like, hey, come on and sit at our table and talk to us about your local government needs. Sometimes they fail to attract enough engagement. And I think that that, yeah, the, you got to create that emotional link. You've got to give people something to, to care about because otherwise, why would you spend your free time doing something that you have no connection to? Yeah. I have I have a little technical question. So I saw the button where you can make questions about the budget. Do you use freedom of information law, or do you connect exactly with the secretary or uh, who is going to to making this? How do you do this? It's it's very important to say that this project has a bottom up approach. So we don't have any special link to the public authorities because we try to say to people that the same law that provides data and information to me as a professor or is available for them as a social movement or school, uh, school children and so on. Everybody can use the freedom of information uh, tool. So 
the the only uh, the the special thing is that we automatize it. So I can send a very simple question: Where is the money? And I I I don't need to identify myself. It's very important because in Brazil, all requests for information must be uh, identified, personally identified. So we try to make a way to, to hide the people that are trying to, to have more information from the public authorities. So caring for my neighborhood robs uh, the, the, the request and, and when we try to balance this power asymmetry, because not always people want to be identified in order to pose a question to the government. Yeah, that, this was a, a question that I, that I really want to hear. That's, that's really cool. That means that this project can be also used in other cities following, at least in Brazil, following the same model, right? Yeah, it's not so easy because we not we don't have a budget data standard here. So mm -hmm. we have more than five thousand cities in Brazil, and everybody published as they want. <laughs> Basically, we have this. Yeah, I, I kind of know that. <laughs> Sonia, I'm, I'm going to go back to Sonia. Uh, you mentioned already uh, that you work with uh, a lot of geeks, <laughs> saying in a good way, of course. Um, yeah, I myself am a geek as well. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's the thing that I already participated in many hackathons and you organize hackathons and other um, uh, uh, events that demands coding skills and... And many people like, uh, let's say, uh, normal people. <laughs> not, not everybody is, uh, does, not everybody has the skills. So um, could you explain uh, to the audience um, what a hackathon is? So this would be nice because not everybody knows that. And in your experience, are those events restrict to people with coding skills or do you see other types of knowledge that might play a role in this event they are trying to create something using technology. I'm going to give you a little spoiler. I do think that lots of skills are required for uh, creating a successful shared project. So not only coding skills and all sorts of ranges of other skills and also some, like, yeah, some emotional skills and emotional accountability and emotional intelligence. That's something that's always very, um, very useful to bring to events. Um, yeah, a quick introduction to hackathons. They are a combination of the word hacking and marathon. So in its basic form, it means that a bunch of people come together for a certain amount of time. This can be a couple of hours, this can be an entire weekend, and they hack so that means and when we say hacking we mean it in the creative like a positive sense of the word where you have such geeky insights such deep knowledge of a subject or a matter or a technology that you can use creative methods creative thinking to like hack the pro like sort of like hack this problem in an unusual way to approach it to find a creative solution and um hackathons can be uh, and have become in recent times more and more popular and they can be used to for for um, what's that the verb in English um, for, for contests and who wins the prize for the most innovative da, 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 da. but that's not what we in our movement like use hackathons for they are more um, Hackathons are a way for people to come together and share their knowledge, not only like work alone on a thing, but to have all ranges of skills and all sorts of different different inputs and yeah, have like a, a co-creation space yeah, for a certain a certain amount of time. And that's those are the best hackathons where you are not driven by the need to develop a specific product and meet the, this and that standard or then you'll win or lose but to just have a room where you can experiment and work on a thing 
amongst like-minded peers and also meet some new people and have nice conversations. Do you think they're becoming more, um, in Brazil, we have a lot of hackathons. We have hackathons in uh, the Tribunais de Contas, the Court of Audits. We have hackathons in many municipalities, many secretaries uh, inside the municipalities. Do you think they're becoming more present in Germany uh, in the last years or is it just an impression? No, they are absolutely becoming more present. When I organized my first hackathon in 2014, that was still in, back in Austria as a, as a volunteer for a, a young coders, like a young coders festival, what's known in Germany now as Jugendhakt, like a big uh, tech, like all sorts of tech formats for young interested people who want to work on um, technical things, but also have some like political engagement. Um, yeah, back in 2014, that was sort of a new format that came up. And now um, Germany has had like the German government in like in uh, cooperation with other organizations has even held two official governments, uh, sorry, two official hackathons to um, find solutions for the, the pandemic. And some of those solutions are not like and this way of just always finding new innovative ideas is not a sustainable way to to build upon our shared knowledge because i think or in my in my opinion and there i'm also reiterating what the, our experts say from the code for code for germany network from our community that hackathons provide like a a quick and easy solution for governments like hey we're doing something we're engaging the public but we're finding new creative projects but what they actually should be doing oftentimes what they should rather be doing is looking at what's already there because on github there's countless of little projects or bigger projects projects that have been funded or financed by our ngo but ran out of money because uh they should have been transferred to government hands. So I think that these hackathons provide, like when they are, when the idea is co-opted, then they can be misused <laughs> as uh, like, oh, let's have this innovation when you should look for a more sustainable approach. It's not as sexy, it's not as cool. You won't have 4,000 new ideas in just 24 hours, but you'll have actual sustainable well-tested products that you can implement into your own government and um, enhance the skills of your own government employees, your administration team, like have IT skills in your local government to and work together with the volunteers and implement those open source solutions that are already there oftentimes. That was my spiel on hackathons. <laughs> No, Gisele, yeah, yeah. do you want to comment that? Because I oh. think this is, was a polemic uh, approach. <laughs> I, was no, not expecting I, I, I think we should look everything like a, a spiral movement. So in, in, in the first phase of many open government data portal, when the government was launching the portal, the hackathon was kind of a public relationship strategy. Oh, let's communicate our, pro, our our portal or open data portal. Oh, bring uh, a dozen of developers and let's do a hackathon. So I think this is the first loop of the this spiral, and I think both the movement, the 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 hacktivists, the open government movement. Uh, both the government side start to understand that if we are really talking about innovation, we should address more the process. So it's very good to have this, this start, many ideas in order to start a conversation. The hackathons, they are very good to start conversations uh, to start process, why your, your data is so poor? So the public authority try to answer that, uh, that, that question. 
oh, sorry, my data is so poor because our internal process is such and such, such this. So it's also important to, to give this, to pose these questions because they sometimes don't remain, remain unanswered. Sometimes they start internal process to have more uh, good quality data, to have better process to collect, to organize, and to offer the public data, because they start to understand with very tangible products. For instance, caring for my neighborhood is an exact example. We don't have good quality data, but we put this data on the map. And everybody says, wow, wonderful, I want this more. So it, it, it's a tangible example how we could deliver better information to the public needs. And the public authorities started to understand what to do to have better data in order to put uh, geocoding, in order to geocode this data, because they also wanted this. And they are uh, at least uh, for five years, they are trying to improve their, 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 data, their data. So I hope one day uh, the city hall is, uh, of Sao Paulo we will have a um, very good platform, but much better than caring for my neighborhood. And our initiative won't be more necessary. So that's my dream to don't have, I don't want to be necessary anymore. <laughs> and. Uh, and hackathons uh, would be like this, uh, an inspiration, an inspiration for the world that we want, that we are, um, that we are trying to, to develop together. And some, in one day, this world will be a reality with, so we don't he need more hackathons, we we'll probably need another kind of initiative. Also hackathons and another kind of initiative. Giselle you, find, Giselle, you find such beautiful words uh, for, for everything. Um, thank you for like putting, like for, for building upon my thing. Uh, yeah, I really love the, the focus on the process, that that's so, that's so important. As, uh, as like, I would put this in, in contrast to focus on products. Yeah, and I think that focus on the process is really, really important. And yes, it is a, it is a two-way stream. You are right, because Governments often want to know, like, what are you doing with our data? Like, why is that useful? And like those those products or hackathons that develop products can give us use cases and showcases. But I feel like in Germany, we are approaching or like we are at the beginning of a time period where we have shown enough. And I think that we should look like on this like spiral. <laughs> I feel like we're at a point where legislation to change and processes should be should be looked at instead of always looking to civic society like show us more show us more no. but you are right it will always be it should always be it should always be a dialogue and it will remain that and we will remain at the at the crossroads of those but i'm also hoping that one day i won't have to do this job anymore because all of the problems that i'm trying to solve with my work <laughs> What have been solved? I'll move on to something else then. Don't worry, we will find new problems to solve. <laughs> this is not a question. <laughs> but what I, I like the, the perspective. I think I think what Sonia made me think right now, I do agree with Giselle. Uh it's it's a dialogue, but what Sonia made me think right now, I think maybe it's is a matter of institutionalization of solutions also, because uh this was this Absolutely. happens to be my my master degree my master degree is about that i i, I wrote 120 pages about this <laughs> about how how to how citizens perceive a solution as a, something that worth their their time so i think and and then this point i think it matches because it's like okay um we are doing this and what is this for? If they don't see their solution implemented or the solution is not used somehow, or there is no, not a further dialogue between city hall and uh, who's, who participated in that. If you're just, it, it could be, it could be, it can be so much more, but there's must be a, a political will to do that. 
And I, I think I think the point was more that I think the point was like okay, we, how we build the dialogue that that Giselle mentioned, how we how we make uh, 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 we build up the knowledge as uh, Sonia said two or three times already. How how can we make this going up and not just uh, a, a little or a cool event when everybody drinks soda and <laughs> but but then we don't take anything for our homes. Uh, or at least the government doesn't take the solutions to our homes because I think for the participants it's always a, a pleasure to to be in a hackathon and uh, to learn a lot, but 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 for the government and for the community. Né? I have a question from our audience and our time is almost up, which is really sad because I had so many things to ask you, <laughs> but I, I put the final question uh, from our audience, uh, Jessica Oyer. Uh, my my we share the same name <laughs> the same for, first name uh she she mentioned there must be a big difference between a country like germany and a developing country like brazil uh so what is the biggest challenge for civil organizations in your countries and if i if i may add to that like when we talk about participation i i think it would be nice to to uh, for civil society uh, organizations there's a lot of problems always but <laughs> but i mean meaning uh, in what we are talking about participation and promoting transparency whoever wants to just to answer first be welcome i think i can start uh, in fact brazil uh, has many countries inside one so we have a very rich regions in brazil like sao paulo where i live now and very poor ones. So I think that our main concern here in Brazil is inequality. So you can imagine that inequality, social inequality, economical inequality is our main challenge in order to, to make this flow of information uh, really makes the difference to the people that lives in such different scenarios, in such different contexts. So I hope that uh, we, uh, as uh, data activists, we could um, have our collaboration in this very complex scenario. And you can imagine in this pandemic period, this pandemic uh, that we are living in, uh, put more lights in our main problems. So, so we have this context that I think many uh, underdevelopment countries uh, share, but they, maybe we also have the same in very rich nations too, that inequality, unfortunately, uh, we have in many contexts in many levels. Uh, talking about our challenge here in Brazil, uh, we are uh, in this moment um, under attack uh, as civil society and as scientists because we are living in a negationist government that diffuses fake news and social division. And also uh, it is uh, undermining our ways to sustain the initiatives, both in the academia and civil society uh, environment. So I think we all uh, we are all sharing the same um, challenging scenario, but I think in Brazil is a little bit worse because we we have to we are having difficult to have funds in order to sustain, to keep our research and our initiative in this moment. So I hope we have better days in the future, better news to share with you, with you in the future years. Yeah, thank you, Giselle. I do, um, I, yeah, I feel a little bit, uh, <laughs> feel like a little bit silly or, or privileged and, and privileged talking about some some of the things that I wrote down uh, that we have as challenges here in Germany. But um, 
there are still there are still things that we we can improve here and that we are working on and i think like regardless of whether you like regardless of how um healthy uh, democracy is it's always good if you have civil societies as watchdogs there and if you don't put the systems in place in a healthy in a healthy democracy then it'll be even harder to get them installed in democracies that are declining yeah um so the challenges in germany that we face when you know, regards to uh, civil society organizations and movements and participation is um legislature regarding open open data and transparency like binding legal standards that are the same for all of all of germany because germany is like very um also has different different states and they all have to different legislature regarding open data so a unified binding legal standard would be great if germany could sign the Chomsky convention we'd be super happy about that we'll see what the new uh, what the new government actually um, delivers on the very uh, good looking promises from the coalition agreement um, what we also lack like is um, infrastructure funding for volunteers in the digital digital sphere there is lots of funding for not, not lots could also be more but a funding for traditional volunteerism like um, red cross or like in your local sports activities, but there is also volunteer work to, done, to be done in the digital sphere and um, NGOs like ours get funded only if mostly funded for new projects and for doing new things, but we would like some infrastructure funding to just like build on the things we have and just keep sustaining the projects that we have and just um, keep keep up the good work that volunteers are doing and support them with what they need and i think that's those are the things that if we had those we'd feel even better and we could do even more and we'd find more things to improve of course because that's also what our job is i think as civil society yeah i think, I think uh being in brazil until uh last year and uh being germany right now and see what's uh happening in brazil i would i would say that uh we were walking towards uh uh towards our new problems and unfortunately uh for the seat for for circumstances that could be avoided and others that could not be avoided all together, we are coming back to our old problems, and this is really sad. Uh, so, just to stress this moment in our history right now, I, I, but I, I'm happy to, I'm happy to know that we are, we are making uh, uh, advance uh, in what is about what has to do with uh, not only participation but actually building knowledge and building new new solutions and i hope uh our work uh our work i mean uh the work of uh collab the work of open knowledge foundation the work of uh other civil societies initiatives that uh promote use innovation to promote social good i hope uh that we still go in in the in an advanced direction um finally <laughs> i would to our time is up unfortunately uh this was a really good talk i didn't see the time going <laughs> and i would like to thank uh professor jo dr giselle Cravero for being here with us it was really really a pleasure to to talk with you see you soon Oh, and I also would like to thank uh, Sonia Fischbauer from the Open Knowledge Foundation for being here with us tonight. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been uh, more inspiring and more a little bit emotional than I thought in a, in a very good way. And I'll definitely be looking more towards towards Brazil. And uh, thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Uni Münster, for um, hosting this talk. And emotion was definitely one of the words today. Uh, emotion is a key for participation. I'm going to say this uh, for my further uh, work experience and life. 
So, and finally, I would like to thank you all who is watching us today or hearing us today in the podcast. Data Talks is a series of talks between experts from Brazil and Germany who discuss the use of public data in today's society. The Data Talks is an initiative from myself, Jessica Fort, as a part of the German Chancellor Fellowship from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and it's hosted and supported by the Brazil Center of the University of Münster in the framework of the strategic partnership project VVU USP, funded by the DAAD. I'll see you on the next talk. Have a nice week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.